Our featured BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charity seal holders for this episode are Defenders of Wildlife, Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee, Fancose, USA. To find out more about these and other BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charities, go to give.org. You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. This is the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBGive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Mark Taylor. Nonprofits seems to be, as you know, my thing here. (laughs) And there are many ways for nonprofits to get organized and to thrive, and in some cases fail. What we're seeing on the scene today, though, is an interesting dynamic that has developed over the last 20 years or so, where nonprofits that are small can get what are known as fiscal sponsors. And these are organizations that can do a lot of the back end work for them so that the organizations can indeed focus on their mission. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today with a gentleman who created an organization that does that. And also his amazing story, which is really fascinating. I think you'll get a lot of good insight from and how someone from a background like his could be so enmeshed in the nonprofit sector. So today we're going to bring with us, we have with us Eric Kessler. And Eric is the founder of Arabella Advisors. And Arabella is that organization I was telling you about. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail right now, but Eric will. Eric is no longer the principal there, but he's a board member and he's going to tell us all about how it got started, what it does and how it's made an impact on a nonprofit sector. So, Eric, welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast. Thanks, Art. What a pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And uh, Eric and I ran into each other about a week ago and I said, you know, I got to get you on the show. Because what you've done is very unusual in terms of how you've decided to support social good organizations and make an impact in the nonprofit sector. And people need to hear about that. But you also told me the story, which I couldn't remember, about reaching out to me when you were thinking about starting this. And I gave you some advice, which sounded a lot like me. But I couldn't remember. <laughs> so. You did. And, uh, you know, I thanked you last week when I saw you, and I'll thank you again now. When I started Arabella almost 20 years ago now, it was a lonely pursuit. I was reaching out to anyone I could asking for advice, and you were kind enough to take a call from someone who really had no business reaching out to you directly, and uh, you were generous with your thoughts, and I'm certainly grateful for that. Well, I'm I'm grateful that you reached out and more grateful that I could actually be helpful. (laughs) So what was the advice I gave you? You know, it's funny because it's the same advice I give to philanthropists and foundations that, that I've been advising through Arabella. You said one thing in particular that was really present, which was don't be deterred. I think when I called you, I had spoken to another leader in the field at the time who was say appropriately dismissive and that who the heck am I? Who's this kid? Who's this guy doesn't know what he's doing and he's thinking he's going to advise billionaires on where to put money in and kind of said, you know, get lost kid. I was kind of down in the dumps and I called you and you were, you were encouraging and thoughtful and and gracious with your uh, insights. The one thing you told me that may seem obvious to some people, but at that moment to me was a breath of fresh air was don't be deterred. Mm. 
and you shared some thoughts about the sector and where things were and where things were going and who was doing what and transparency and impact and what made a difference and what didn't. We talked about equity and a few other things. But that's what I remember is you just saying, listen, don't be deterred. Well, I'm really glad I'm glad to hear that because that not being deterred really led to something pretty amazing happening with you and this organization, Arabella. But for, before we get into this too much, let's talk about Arabella. What is it? Tell our guests who wouldn't know necessarily about Arabella uh, what it is and what it does. Yeah, thanks. Arabella is a philanthropy consulting company. It's an LLC that really has three main arms to its work. First is as a strategy consultant, and that's really what I started the company to be. Philanthropists, foundations, impact investors say, I want to do X. How do I get that done? Or they say, I don't know what I want to do. I just inherited a bunch of money or I just sold my business and I don't really know what I want to do. Help me do that. And so we have a team of, I think, some of the smartest people in philanthropy who build strategies for a whole broad range of individual philanthropists, family philanthropists, foundation executives, business philanthropists, impact investors. That's what I started the business to be. And then we quickly rolled into our second area of work, which is fiscal sponsorship. And so Arabella provides services, Arabella is a business, provides services to a range of independent nonprofit organizations that serve as fiscal sponsors. And so we we'll talk more about fiscal sponsorship, but essentially we're a, an, an HR, a finance grant operations backend service provider to a handful of fiscal sponsor nonprofits that that we help start and operate independently, but with the support of, of Arabella. And then more recently, we got into a third area of work, which is sort of pure back office operation support for independent organizations. So uh, we acquired a company in New York called Kiwi Partners, still operates under that name, that is at its core an accounting firm, but also provides HR benefits, financial planning support for hundreds of, of smaller nonprofits. So those are sort of the three arms, whereas we, as the firm tries to be sort of a one-stop shop for philanthropists and the projects they support. Great. Well, I'm particularly interested in I guess, mission one and mission three. Right. I haven't really had enough money to worry too much about mission two. Yeah. Yeah. You're on your way. <laughs> but hey, maybe someday, maybe someday. But mission one and mission two really around supporting the back end of these organizations. What are your clients typically like when they come to you? Who, who is it that will come to you, Eric, and say, we could use your help? Yeah. As I built the firm, the answer to that question evolved over time, as you'd imagine. Though we had a pretty good start. Our, our, our first client back in 2005 was a large, well-known foundation that was making an annual grant to a big nonprofit, and they wanted to add a zero to the check and, and asked us to do an independent evaluation of that, uh, of that organization before they dramatically increased the amount of support. And that's where really where we got our start with these big institutional foundations, but then also family foundations that would come to us and say, we're too small to hire our own staff, but we're too big to do it on our own as a family. So can you, Arabella, you know, sort of be our sort of our part time executive director? Can you sort of manage our foundation? It's grown over time where almost 45 out of the 50 largest foundations in the country use Arabella's services in one way or another. And a whole bunch of new billionaires who, again, either don't know what they want to do or have an idea of what they want to do, but don't know how to do it. Uh, along the way, we worked with a lot of corporate foundations and corporate philanthropists. And then over the last 10 years or so, lots of impact investors who have treated impact investing as a extension of their philanthropic work. And so we built an individual's philanthropy efforts in economic development in the city where he lived. And then he asked us to extend that into an, into an investment strategy that would center around economic development and equity in that. So it's a pretty broad range. And I should say our clients have been, are all over the political map also. We have a pretty broad range of diversity of clients which has kept things interesting over the years. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet it has. Because we're at a very polarizing time, as you know, 
And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about that too, but I'm really interested, Eric, in kind trying to understand the way you were able to get this off the ground. You mentioned that you and I talked early on, you know, it, it can be tough to break into this space to provide those kinds of services. There are a lot of, there's a lot of skepticism, you know? Well, it was interesting. It was 2005. I was working full time in another job and I was also getting a executive MBA at Georgetown uh, Business School at the time. And I spent about a year and a half researching the world of philanthropy. I had been in government service and on, and on the nonprofit side my whole career, and I decided I wanted to go into philanthropy. And so I spent about a year and a half researching philanthropy and figuring out what was new and interesting and different and where the needs were and, and trying to make some educated guesses as to where it was going. And then I matched that with what I thought my skills were and my assets and my networks and what could I bring to this. And that sort of landed me on this business model for a, essentially sort of a one-stop shop philanthropy consulting business. And not without a lot of thought and a lot of planning, launched the day after I got my business degree. And it, it was an interesting time to start a company. Very few players in the field at that time. I mean, there were the nonprofit leaders, yourself and, and others that were on sort of the effectiveness and impact and evaluation and that side of philanthropy. There were a fair number of sort of locally based philanthropy advisors, mostly on a municipal level. There were, I counted at one point, about 60 or 70 of those across the country. And there were really only three or four organizations and firms that were trying to work at a national or international level. And I thought I sort of carved out a little niche, driven partially by the services we were going to offer and partially by my own personal networks, having built relationships while in government service and in the nonprofit world and made a go of it. So that was 2005. It's been a journey since then. So you had a network. You mentioned previous nonprofit engagements. What are some of the other organizations that you were connected with via work or volunteering and so forth? Yeah. One, I had the good fortune of growing up in a in a philanthropic family in Chicago. And so that was a privilege in every sense of the word. So I, I knew a lot of donors in the Chicago area where I grew up. But then I worked in the conservation movement, working for some large environmental nonprofit organizations like the League of Conservation Voters and others, and interacted with a lot of donors, a lot of donors to those organizations. And, you know, I'm sort of a collector of relationships. And so I would, you know, meet people and get to know them and learn a lot about them and sort of store that away. And then that definitely benefited the business later in life when I could go back to some of those people and see how they're doing, see if they had needs, see if we could be helpful, see if they knew others that needed help. And then I was in government service for about four years in my 20s. What was that service? I was in the Clinton administration as a young junior staffer at the Department of Interior, but I was a political, I was a White House appointee and, and interacted with a lot of business leaders, a lot of philanthropic leaders whose interests and values aligned with the administration. And so again, sort of built those relationships. Fantastic. Yeah. I took a departure from there and went overseas for seven years. Really? I worked on the front lines of democracy in the early 2000s working for an organization that was chaired by the late Madeleine Albright. And so I was spent time all around the world in the former Soviet Union and Southeast Asia and the Middle East, supporting women's organizations, student organizations, opposition political leaders that were pushing for democratic change in mostly authoritarian countries. And again, built relationships with international donors, with foundations, with government leaders all around the world. And that experience really showed me it showed me how philanthropic resources and even government resources were being used really effectively, but also how in some places they weren't being used very effectively. And so that really sort of got me going and said, hey, again, it was 2005. There's a lot of money being created, a lot of wealth being generated in the dot-com bubble. And gosh, you know, these folks are going to are gonna become major philanthropists. And somebody's got to figure out how to help them make sure that they're resources are used effectively and efficiently and equitably. And that sort of bore out the idea of Arabella, which is as all this wealth is being generated, I didn't know what they were going to need, but I knew they were going to need help. I knew that they were going to do their philanthropy differently than, you know, my parents' generation 
were doing philanthropy. They were making money in new and different ways, and they were going to certainly spend it in new and different ways. And so that was sort of the bet that I made was, you know, could I somehow leverage all these relationships I had and networks I had built and experiences I had around the world to build trust with new wealth generators to the extent that they would rely on myself and the firm I was building to, to, to ensure that their philanthropy was effective and efficient and equitable and, uh, and impactful. Now, your, your brand of cause plays out to some extent in your work too, right? I mean, the things that matter to you, I think you get to work on to some extent. How were you able to, I guess, connect the causes that matter to you most to your work? Was that in what clients you accepted and didn't accept? Or, or were you more agnostic in terms of, of that, or at least in the early days? It's a really interesting question. So when I started, I wanted to be all things to all people, which is probably not a smart way to start a business, to be honest, but it sort of made sense to me at the time because I didn't really know what people wanted. And so, so I really put aside the issues that I had experience with and, and interest in and really looked at the networks of people I knew, which spanned geography span interest, span politics, span just about every sort of measure there is. And I said, how can we help you? What do you want to get done? And I did that very purpose because I wanted to build a broad firm that worked on every issue under the sun that, that, you know, where we could bring the best intelligence in the philanthropy world, I, th- I thought, I think, to donors with a broad background. And so that has had us work with fifth generation, sixth generation, wealthy families from the oil industry to brand newly minted billionaires, you know, made their money in, in Bitcoin last week. Mm-hmm. It also had us working with some of the most sort of progressive philanthropists in the world, but also at times some of the most conservative philanthropists. There's some issues that we chose not to touch because it, it sort of didn't align with even a sort of stretch of our values. And, and, and so, you know, look, if, if somebody wanted to figure out how to put more guns into schools, you know, they weren't going to call me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they probably would call me to begin with, and if they did, I would have said, "Sorry, that's not us. We're not. We're not the guy for you." And so, there's been a handful of issues that we've opted not to work on. We're probably better known now for supporting progressive donors, but the reality is, when you look at our client base, we have a, a great diversity of of clients, and and most of our clients, I couldn't even tell you what they're you know, sort of political ideology is because it doesn't come up in conversation. If they're trying to support economic development in a in a city or support rural America and jobs and conservation in rural America, you know, we're not sitting around talking about politics. We're talking about policy and we're talking about community. And so it's been a great opportunity for me to learn about all these issues that I had no background on. And we were hiring experts and hiring people who who knew that stuff over time because I founded the business and, you know, I was able to sort of pick and choose what I worked on. And so I, I have a real passion for food system change and equity and nutrition and, and health and sustainability and food. So, so, you know, in the last years when I was still working full time for the business, that's where I chose to spend my time. But the firm continues to work across a diversity of clients and a pretty broad range of issues. And, you know, the Wise Giving Alliance, my employer we are pretty open to whoever wants to be a charity as long as you're willing to meet our standards. And we do have people who have competing missions and we're, we're like, okay, let's let the best ideas win, you know, and we're not going to tell you what mission is better than the other. What we're going to tell you is, are they accountable, transparent, managing their finances well and doing what they say they would do. That's really what, what matters, I think. And so we, we're fortunate in America that we can create space for divergence. That I think is what makes this country so great. And we're doing our little part. looks like you've done your part as well. So uh, there's, there's definitely uh, some kindred spirit in that. Yeah. And it's hard because, you know, from your work, you know, people try and pigeonhole you and say, you're this and not that. And so in my case, people say, you know, you're, you, you work on all these lefty policy issues and not a, you know, one of my favorite clients is a client who cares about animal rescue. There's no politics in animal yeah, rescue. Right. <laughs> so, 
it's part of the battle of having a, a business that's grown and is you know now 550 people or so trying to break out of the silos and the pigeonholes that other people try to put you in mostly i just ignore it but it's not easy and now it's time for our giving tips segment with bennett weiner one of the world's most renowned experts on charity accountability and the COO of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. One of our voluntary standards calls for at least three evenly spaced meetings over the course of the year for a charity's board of directors with the majority in attendance. And donors generally expect the people who are represented as being in charge of the organization, the board of directors, to show up at meetings and to actually be engaged in the oversight of the organization. So that's why we call for at least three meetings, not just a single meeting per year with some other subcommittee making decisions in the interim, but at least three meetings per year and with an average majority in attendance because they're expecting those board members to show up over the course of the year and be actively participating in those decisions. In many cases, people are represented as being on the board as a way of also instilling confidence in donors and knowing that they're engaged in helping to lead the organization in the right directions and providing appropriate oversight over the staff of the organization as well. So if you're serving on a board of directors or if you're just checking out a charity, you want to have confidence that people are actually attending meetings and showing up and engaged in those decisions. And that's one of the things that we do in verifying if a charity meets this particular standard. Eric, let's go back to your early days. So you were obviously oriented and you said you came up in a family that was philanthropic. What were some of the activities or messages that were sent through your family to you that told you, you know, this is something that you have to do? I mean, how would you express that? Gosh, I, 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 it's going to sound cliche, but I feel like sort of giving back and engaging in community and, and helping others was ingrained in my value system through example by my grandparents, my parents through faith growing up in the Jewish tradition and through lived experience. It was just part of who we were as a family, who we are as a family. I knew pretty early on I I wasn't destined to work in the family company. I was, you know, destined to to work in the social sector and giving back through not just through my philanthropy, but through the business I created and the work I did in the government. So it's a privilege and I appreciate it's a privilege. It also is a responsibility and something that I take very seriously. It's how I've oriented my life and and that's created lots of opportunity and it's closed other opportunities, as you can imagine, but um, I wouldn't do it any other way. What are some of the things you had to sacrifice? Well, building a business is sacrifice. Art, I started a company, bought a 110-year-old house, and had my first child all within three months of each other, which is a terrible idea. Especially the 110-year-old house. because I had one of those, too, and I can tell you, it, it takes a minute to get it where you need it to be. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I was starting a business, so I was on the road. I was out hustling. I mean, anybody that starts any kind of business or any kind of nonprofit knows you know, you're out on the road. And I was out in Seattle seeing our friends at the Gates Foundation every three or four weeks. I was going to every conference. I was speaking everywhere I could. I was taking coffees as much as possible. And so so that was the biggest sacrifice was just all, it's it's funny looking back post COVID that we were, <laughs> so many of us are used to being home. And I li- think back to my schedule in those first 10 years and it was just barnstorming. And, you know, that's what you got to do to build any kind of enterprise. And so spending more time with my kids now, I was able to in those early days. But it's also putting yourself out there. And that's a risk, I think. Again, any kind of enterprise you start, whether it's a nonprofit or a business or you know, government leadership, putting yourself out there is tough. And it's, it's getting tougher with social media and with all the internet stuff where you make yourself a target for no, no good deed goes unpunished. And and, and that's a, a sacrifice. I, I wouldn't do it any other way, but nonetheless. So, Eric, one, one thing that your work is kind of connected to is this 
notion of dark money. On the one hand, you know, just the concept of dark money sounds like it can be really a, a funky thing. But on the other hand, maybe it's not such a bad thing. I mean, what, what's your or first? Let's talk about what it is. And then let's talk about yeah. the, the pros and cons of it. So dark money really started with Supreme Court decision known as a Citizens United decision mm -hmm. brought by some conservative Republicans who wanted primarily companies to be able to give unlimited dollars to, into politics. They won that case. Progressives, including myself, pushed really hard against it and thought that it would be a, a that it would be a corrupting force in in politics and society. Out of that decision, it's complicated, but out of that decision came this opportunity through 501c4 organizations, which are an IRS designated class of organizations that are designed to enable donors to give to an organization without being identified as the donor. So the Republicans fought for it, the IRS designated it, and now there's an opportunity for any donor to give to a cause remaining anonymous, which I think the anonymity piece is, is interesting. It's many have, people have that in their faith tradition to give anonymously. Other people give anonymously because of security. And because I was talking about how you no know, good deed goes unpunished and you get targeted and all this stuff. And some people give money. I think some of those early corporations that the Republicans were fighting for give money without wanting to be connected to the cause that they're giving to because it hurts their image or, or, or whatever. Well, when Arabella started providing fiscal sponsor services, we provide those services to both 501c3 organizations, traditional nonprofit organizations that most people think of that do disclose their donors as well as some 501c4 organizations that don't disclose their donors. We figured out a way to manage 501c4 organizations and to engage 501c4 organizations in policy advocacy in a way that was sort of supercharged in their scale and their impact, which I'm super proud of. With that became a lot of anonymous giving and that's where it gets the sort of dark money. It's dark. You can't see it. It's opaque. You don't really know where the money's coming from or going to. And that has grown significantly. It's grown significantly in the progressive world. It's grown just as significantly in the conservative world. And honestly, Art, and I've said this before, I wish it all went away. Arabella provides, does a lot of work in that area, mm. sure benefits from that work. And I would trade that to get rid of, of dark money any day. But as long as the why do you say that? Why do you say that though? Because yeah, I mean, and I'm not a pro or con, but I want to ask you that because as I think about it, some people do have a legitimate reason yeah. to not be made known. Right? They they just yeah. want to remain anonymous. I'm not saying that right. that that may not be the case for the vast majority of people. I don't know. Right. Some people might be real staunch conservatives and find that they want to support a gun control measure or they want to support organizations that are really doing some regulatory work that maybe many of their ilk might not appreciate or approve, right? So you want to see the thing happen and you don't necessarily want to get, you know, be ostracized from your community. I think there's common sense ways to do this, to enable anonymous giving without it being such a predominant force in our country's policy and, and politics. And so I, you know, I get yelled at all the time of, you know, well, you're, you're, you've grown dark money. You're do more that you're, you know, you're, you're a leading force in that. And my answer is, Hey, listen, you know, the progressives, which I count myself on as one would be crazy to give it up unilaterally. As soon as the conservatives are ready to, to evolve and transform and bring some common sense approaches to undisclosed donors you know, we're ready to do the same thing in fact we, we've we've i've uh, supported legislation that addresses that i you know, support it again even at the you know even at the expense of my own business and what i've built i just think it's important so i support anonymous giving i think what it's grown into as such a predominant force in american society i, I think it's beyond the original concept of 
anonymous giving, which dates back, you know, decades and decades. And the Citizens United piece really supercharged it. I think it's problematic. So we're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep supporting it until all sides are ready to rein it in. Yeah, well, it can be hurtful to a cause, let's say, that's being attacked and they don't know where the attack is coming from. You know, th- that can be a bit challenging, particularly if, if the attack isn't necessarily factual, right? You, you, you're having people coming at you and they're saying these things and they're doing, and you can't even fight back because you don't know who's making these claims or who's behind it or what their interests are, right? That's the real thing. You don't know what their interests are in making the claim about you. Their interests may be self-serving more so than cause related. And, and here you are, you can't expose that. So. Yeah. And we see that when an oil company is giving to an organization that's fighting against climate change or provide or, or funding research anonymously. Right. That's not accurate. And, right. and, you know, you kind of wonder where that's coming from. And, right. and so it shouldn't have happened in the first place. And now that it's out there, it needs to be reformed. What would you, how would you reform it? Well, I think I'd limit it in some ways. I think I would create disclosures for, for businesses. I think I'd require, you know, sort of corporate entities and people with a financial interest to disclose their financial interests. I'd figure out a way to discern between one's sort of personal values of anonymity. I give not for attention, but because it's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And those who are hiding from the impact that they're having. And so so I'm not suggesting it's easy. Sheldon Whitehouse and and some other folks up in the Hill in Washington have, have thoughts on how to make it better and how to rein it in. I think some Republicans do as well. And it needs to be addressed, but no one's going to unilaterally disarm I spent 18 years building a business that in part works in the world of undisclosed donors. Yeah. I'm not working there anymore (laughs) uh, full time. And so I've got time on my hands. If anybody wants to sit down from the conservative side or the progressive side or nonprofit side or government, I'm ready to sit down and brainstorm and, and come up with solutions. Well, listen, there, that, that might be a convergence table. We should definitely talk. There you go. There you go. So listen, I I wanted to just check in with you a little bit about the nonprofit sector. You've been around it in some way or or another all your life. You've seen a lot of organizations in action. You've seen successes. You've seen failures. You've seen shifts in how we do our work. Where are we headed? I mean, there's some concerning trends on the horizon. I'm really concerned about this decline in donors decline in the number of donors as well as the amounts of money. We were together a week or so ago, and one of the questions on the table was about the future of philanthropy. And my thought here and biggest concern was, you know, we have these really wealthy people, which is fine. I mean, great. Many of them have pledged to give away half their wealth during their lifetime. But they make money so fast that they don't seem to be able to give it away yeah. fast enough before they. In other words, I think Mackenzie Scott gave away something like some. I think the number seventeen billion dollars over the last few years, and she's earned well in excess of that during that same period. And she's given her money away as as fast as we've seen, right? Yeah. So where are we headed here, Eric? I mean, we got AI and generative AI coming in. We've got new forms of social giving and social good out there. What concerns you? What gives you optimism? Where are we headed? Probably split 50-50 between concerns and optimism. So one, I think folks saying that the wealthy aren't giving away fast enough. They, you know, they, they signed up for the giving pledge, which I think was a tremendous force in philanthropy over the last 20 years, but don't seem to be giving away the money or they put it, they're parking in a donor advised fund or let it sit there, whatever it is. I think there's truth on both sides of that debate. One is, I think there's plenty of folks who aren't living up to commitments and aren't giving away money at the pace that even they themselves said that they would, or that for better worse, society thinks they should. I think that's accurate. At the same time, I think, you know, the pace at which a Mackenzie Scott, and she's a great example, but there's a hundred others, are giving is tremendous. And what you don't want to do is say, 
is force money to go out the door in inefficient and ineffective ways. And so there is something to be said about absorbative capacity of nonprofits and about strategic grant making and about the danger of spending money unwisely. And so, you know, I think that there's two sides to that, to that debate, but here's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about decreasing trust in institutions and certainly in government institutions, which I think is mm, tragic, okay. um, but also in the nonprofit sector. And I don't know, Art, how to put that back in the bottle because there's so much information, there's so much disinformation, and there's so much, it's so hard to navigate. People get into these echo chambers. And so around the time I called you the first time, all anybody want to talk about was, you know, how much money is going to overhead? How much money is going to overhead? And, you know, we realized that that was sort of a false debate because, right. you know, you got to have overhead yeah. to pay, you know, the, the, the program needs an office, right. you know, the program needs a photocopier, it needs an right. admin person. So, but now people are picking apart organizations and institutions and finding all the bad and all the reason not to engage. And, and the level of trust is just so low. So, I, you know, you raised the notion you know, that the number of donors is decreasing. And I wonder how much of that is trust. I mean, I wonder how much of that is driven by, you know, folks had trust in organizations, you know, would they give more? So it, that, and that, that alone is just a microcosm of a complex, you know, cause you know, it's easy to say, well, you know, the red cross or, you know, some of these meg United way, some of these meg organizations, you know, are sort of easier to trust. Well, you know, as well as I do that, Sometimes the most effective and efficient organizations are the small ones, the tiny ones, the community organizations, the organizations that are living off $100 donations, not a million dollar donations. And so I think we need a sort of Manhattan Project to rebuild trust in the social sector. I don't know how to do that. But again, I'd be happy to join that conversation and think entrepreneurially about how one does that. I, I worry about this, the sort of social media and, and how it is contributing to a decline in, in trust in all institutions, but including the social sector. Well, I, I agree with that. And I, I talk about this from time to time on the show. My perspective is that organizations and institutions didn't just get bad. They've always had issues. We just didn't know it, right? We just didn't know a lot of what goes on inside of organizations. And so now that we have this information and now that there's this ability to see things that we didn't see before or people to just say things that they couldn't have a bullhorn to say before, we're now less trusting, right? But what I try to tell people is that we need institutions. You know, we have a lot of advocacy, which is great. We have a lot of activists, which is wonderful. But an activist alone is not going to solve any problems. They're going to bring attention to problems. They're going to help us see things maybe that we should pay attention to. But it takes an institution to solve a problem and, and institutions in general, because they got to work on a problem. They got to understand it. They got to pull the right people together. They got to raise funds for it. They have to find ways to embed it in the marketplace to so that it functions on a long-term basis. And that's not something that you get from activism alone. I'm not knocking activism. I think we, I love activism. I'm an activist myself. But when it comes to solving problems, we need institutions and they are not perfect. Institutions are made up of people. People are not perfect. We're asking imperfect people to work together on problems that are difficult to solve, there are going to be problems. No way around it. But what do you replace it with? Just people out there making noise? That doesn't do anything either. So I, I try to hope, what I'm pushing, hoping for, is that maybe we trust less, maybe, but we continue to work with and support, just understanding that People are imperfect and these institutions aren't going to get it right all the time. If you if you're concerned, get involved, you know, give your money, try to get involved. But that's not throw it, throw out. That's kill all the institutions. That makes sense. 
Americans. Now, there there are some institutions that I can see, you know, we need to probably sunset them because they're not doing any good work and they can't seem to figure out the ethical problem. I mean, it's it's just one stream of bad act after another. OK, let's do something about that. But that's not the vast majority, certainly of nonprofits. And I would say corporations either as as difficult as it is. Right. To always do the right thing when your motive is profit. <laughs> right. It's not always easy to do the right thing. But I think we're going to get a great test of that, Eric, with generative AI. We get to decide now whether we want to have a world in which these technologies are human centered or whether they're profit centered. We get to decide. And obviously, I think corporations are going to be leading in this because there's huge profit potential in it. But on the other hand, it would be very short sighted for them to only focus on that to the detriment of society writ large because it's going to hurt them, too. So we're going to have a great test of this, I think, in the corporate sector in the next five to 10 years. And we'll yes. see where we come out. But, but for the average person out there, put your social media down. Understand that this is the way it's been for a while. Yes, when things go bad, we need to call people out on it and they need to get fixed. They need to get fixed and companies need to respond when they're called out. Nonprofits need to respond when they're called out. But we can't throw the organizations out. We need organizations. America is based on organizations People coming together and doing stuff. That's how we. That's how this country works. Well, I, Art, I agree. I, I worry it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I hope that if it does get worse, that's fast, and uh, that it gets better quickly, and that we return to trust in institutions, and we return to community, and we return to civil discourse. And it's interesting you said that we get to decide on generative AI, and I hope that's the case. I don't know who the we is, but I, I hope we do. <laughs> well, well, I, yeah, I think we as a society, whatever that means, right? And, you know, you can just imagine a continuum. On one end of the continuum are people who just believe we should not even have this generative AI. It's, it's, it's a scourge on humanity, right? On the other end of the spectrum, we have people in corporate offices trying to figure out how they can run the company without any employees. Right. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, those two frameworks are probably out there somewhere already. And what we have to do as a society is figure out, well, where do we want to come out on all this? Where do we want this to, what works for humanity is ultimately going to be, because if it's just a drive for profit, co competitive forces will kick in and that's where it'll end. Well, and I hope there's a, I, I hope there's a role for philanthropy and, you know, independent thinking and, and independent resources to help shape that. So it sounds like there's at least one or two conversations with you coming up on a few big issues. So that's some time. Yeah, I'm, I'm still focused on, on improving our food system. And I think about that policy and through investing in businesses and, you know, little of this, little of that. I'm not going away. Just figuring out the next big thing. Hopefully it's with you. That'd be fun. Well, Eric, look, I've appreciated this. This has been a really wonderful time that you've given me and our listeners. Very rarely, I'm sure, will people get a chance to hear your story the way you've laid it out here and to also get some ideas of where you may be going, what you may be doing. Now that you're just a board member at Arabella, we've got to figure out what we're going to do with your next chapter. You know? <laughs> Come on. What a pleasure. Thank you. So to all of our listeners, you've just heard Eric Kessler who is the founder of Arabella Advisors. Now he's, I wouldn't say retired, but he's no longer in the company on a day-to-day -day basis. But he is a board member and he's given us a lot to unpack here and think about. And we are thankful for him. And to all of you who are listening to this for the first time, just remember that this is a weekly podcast and you can hear a new episode every Tuesday I hope you'll subscribe. And if you're interested in supporting the podcast, you can do that, too, by just going to give.org. And I can guarantee you we'll put that donation to great use. 
And thank you for listening. And hopefully we'll see you back here next week. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.